Hey everyone, what's up? So let's get it started. So let's go back a sec. Let's begin by, first of all, contextualizing what gives a currency legitimacy, because this is going to be important in this talk. So the way I see it, you got trust, acceptance, and value, and all those things need to be present. And in this case, we assume that we have trust, and that comes through the blockchain in a digital currency. Uh, acceptance, uh, that's another type of consensus. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Assume you're, you're, you're designing a currency, you've marketed it, people want to use it. So really, I'm going to talk about value, and I'm going to talk about how engineering design drives the value of your currency. So what, what's necessary to do that? There is an, another component, which I'll mention right at the end, but that's what this talk's going to be about. So specifically, we're going to talk about the Burn and Mint uh, tokenomic scheme. And uh, to give a little bit of an overview of what that is, in the Burn and Mint model, basically you have contributors and consumers and the platform in between. The contributors, they provide a service to the platform. The platform provides a service to the consumer. And there's some tokens involved. The way these tokens work is the contributors are paid in these tokens, and these tokens get generated out of nothingness, basically. And the consumers, they are paying with these tokens. And when they pay, these tokens get burned. So conceptually, that's what's happening here. So, uh, but let's focus on the consumer part first. Like, what, uh, what is a consumer, how do they think? Because it's important. Well, consumer is looking at just the service, right? It, trying to, to figure out what does it cost to me and uh, well, how much am I willing to pay for it? Is this, does this provide value to me? And they can be, these services can be priced in any currency, but typically services are going to be priced in the consumer's unit of account, which is fiat. Uh, in most uh, experiences that I know of. And protocols, in order to price the services in fiat, what they do is they use like a pricing oracle in order to invert the price and then give you the token price. So basically, the price can fluctuate uh, uh, in the token, but in fiat, it stays pretty consistent, right? So let's fill out the picture. So in to on top of the schematic that I just showed, you've also got this exchange. So the exchange uh, is a place where tokens are bought and sold. Um, you have this new category of uh, participant called a speculator. Uh, speculators, in this case, is someone, some people we can probably forget about. Speculators are there. I think about them as arbitrageurs trying to actually trying to find the true price of the token. But in r realistically, the consumers and the contributors, they can be speculators, but that's a separate component of their identity. What's important is that price oracle. So that price oracle is a uh, determinant of what the price of that service will be. And the price is the inverse price of whatever the price of the token is on that exchange, right? So, but before we go into more detail, let me just give you a little bit about history about uh, burn mint and burn mint equilibrium. Uh, and, and right after that, we can start with the meat of this presentation. Basically, the genesis uh, or invention of uh, Burn and Mint was uh, done by a project called Factum, uh, formerly known as Factum. And they introduced this uh, back, back in 2016, I believe. And later it was popularized through an article by uh, Kyle Samani of Multicoin uh, in uh, New Models for Utility Tokens. It was later further refined with the, uh, the proposal of HIP20, which was a helium improvement uh, proposal, uh, in which they introduced a deflationary burn and mint. The community introduced this, uh, basically not minting a consistent, the same amount of tokens, but to uh, decrease the amount of tokens as time goes on in terms of rewards to miners, or as I've called them, contributors. Finally, we get to today, which is analysis, right? So Onikoi, we at Onikoi have provided some analysis. We're, we're, the, we're the scientists that are sort of like taking credit for all the work that has been done before us, uh, you know, a la Isaac Newton and Leibniz. But basically, this work that we have uh, done is uh, it's a, it's a, like a peer-reviewed paper uh, that, that, that is, has been published, I think, at this point in, uh, on IEEE Explore, but it's called 
that you can see there, burn and mint tokenomics, deflation, and strategic incentives. So basically, we've analyzed burn and mint from a strategic standpoint, like a game theoretic standpoint. So what's the strategy of token holders? What's the optimal strategy of token holders? And why is that important? Well, it's important because if you're a token holder, you can have a lot of questions in your head about like, what gives uh, tokens value. And uh, being part of Onikoi for a while now, I see our community uh, speculating on this, and I see all sorts of questions, many of them irrational, perhaps, or certainly rational to somebody, but not necessarily strategic, not necessarily thinking about how should I strategically behave as a token holder, and, uh, and what gives me, when is this token overpriced and when is it underpriced? And that's why it's important to do these, uh, this sort of work, even though it may look a little bit esoteric. And to start really getting into this, like, let's think about what is rational. Like, what's the first component of this rational scheme? Well, it's firstly consumers don't care about the token price. All right, I mean, like I said, they could be speculators and consumers. Speculation is part of, a different part of their identity. But as a consumer, you're looking to buy this thing. And you, it's, if it costs 50 bucks or whatever the service is, the price is 50, it's $50. And the token price doesn't matter to you. It could be one cent, it could be one dollar. You're still going to pay $50 for this with perhaps a little more because you got to buy that token, spend a little bit of your time. Maybe there's a service that does that for you, a value-added service that like, takes 3%. I don't know. But the point is, you're paying about $50 for this thing uh, as advertised. So what that means is that uh, if you think about it, like, let's say the exchange were just, there was just one participant in the exchange. Let's say the platform itself were setting the price, like through, let's say, like a centralized economy or something like that, uh, or a fully planned economy. And let's say the fiat price is five, right? Well, if the token price is also five, that means it's going to be worth one token. And then when you sell that service, you just, again, inverse, your value capture of the platform side is going to be five. So the price is five, the value capture is five. Same thing with, the, again, price is five, but then let's say as a mon mon uh, the, the only participant on the exchange, you set the price to whatever you want it to be, and you say it's 250. Well, now it's worth two tokens. And again, your value capture is five. My point with this slide is that it doesn't matter. You can play with this token price all day. As a platform, you are also valued in fiat. And you can be valued in fiat. You can choose to be valued in some, whatever you want. But if we analyze this from, uh, from being uh, valued in fiat, the price is five. The consumer doesn't care. Your value capture is five in, in, in fiat. So if anybody's measuring you in fiat, it's just going to be five. The token price doesn't matter there either. But when does it matter? It matters when it's not monopolistic, when there are multiple players on the exchange. And in this case, it starts to become interesting because you can have player A saying, OK, I got this pile of tokens, and player B also having this pile of tokens. How many tokens am I willing to, to put up on the exchange to sell? And the way to think about it is, well, look, like, you have this forced revenue going into the exchange, or sorry, forced cash going into this exchange. And it's being forced because that consumer needs to buy this service, right? And you know that it's coming. So you can be the one to, to, to get some of this money, or you could not be. It's, it's, it's up to you. So the question is, how many of your tokens are you sh you should you be willing to give up to get that knowing that those tokens will be taken by that consumer and burned, right? So player A and B, they put in A and B, respectively, amount of tokens in. And the amount of cap value that they're going to capture from the incoming fiat revenue here, it's going to be proportional to the amount of tokens that they put in. So it's just me explaining how this works. And in that sense, burn and mint is a proportional revenue sharing mechanism. And so now we can really start to analyze and see uh, how this game should be played. So moving forward, if you take a look at, this, uh, at, at any player, they are probably thinking, OK, so I have this incoming fiat, uh, or expected incoming fiat, and 
I have to determine my expected outgoing burn. So the value of all of that fiat, we could call V, the value of all the burn that's going to go out, so that's basically your pile that you're holding of tokens, that's going to be called, called Q. The first result that I'm, I'm going to mention here, which is quite cool and important, it's that the ratio of the burn, current burn to the, your pile of tokens should be equal to the incoming revenue at that time divided by the entire value, expected value, of the, of, of, of the fiat. And I could, th this will take a very long time, not out of scope for this presentation to explain why this is and, and go into details about mathematics, but intuitively it makes sense. Because, and you can think about it kind of like a no ARB type of argument, through a no ARB type of argument, because let's say the ratios are off. There's always an opportunity for a speculator to come in and make a little bit of money. So those, the ratio of those two piles, one the fiat pile and the, the, the token pile, and the amounts that you take off the top should be about the same. And, and, this is, and what this means is that the value of a Burnham Mint economy is equal to the net present value of the cash flow. So, Basically, the value of cash that's going to be coming in. And that's really how you should think about this, uh, of, about burn and mint, when you're trying to value it. Anyway, before going on, uh, I'm going to get to this Goldilocks stuff pretty soon. But before going on, what's the effect of mint? Minting is basically future tokens that haven't come to you yet. So I was talking about piles of tokens. Well, you could have a pile right now, but you could also have, addition, in addition to that pile, an expected amount that's going to be coming in. And for that reason, you should probably be more willing to burn more tokens in the current time because you have an expectation of more uh, tokens coming into the future for the same reason that, you know, let's say, a young person uh, may be more ready to take on risk than an older person just because they have more time and more uh, economic opportunities ahead of themselves. And some math now. Um, if before <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't think that was math. But uh, basically, you've got these uh, two uh, sketches here. One is that there's economic value, right? It's driven by the revenue coming in, and it, it decreases with the amount of mint rewards priced in fiat. The token supply, similar. It increases with amount of mint and decreases with amount of burn. And you get these two... two uh, dynamic equations. And the first one is, again, a net present value type of equation, where rho is your discount rate. So that's the, the discount rate, the prevailing discount rate of the, uh, that the people share within an economy. And mu is the token price. So mu m is the amount of payment going to your contributors, right? And y is the amount of payment coming into the platform from consumers. But you get into this Goldilocks problem. So if you look at the value equation, and you look at the price dynamics. So the price dynamics here, uh, because uh, it's a deflationary e e economy because of the discount rate, is positive. The price is always, is always going up. And, but the problem here is it's not enough for the price to go up because mu times m needs to be a certain amount. If mu m is large, what you're doing is you're paying contributors too much from the perspective of token holders. So token holders will abandon your economy because they'll be like, I'm not getting enough uh, of enough value. If it's too small, then you're not paying your contributors enough. And again, although your token holders might seemingly like it at first, no one's going to like it when you are getting zero contributions to your platform. And in that case, your economy will also collapse. So, but the main thing now to think about is what does this depend on? And if we start to think about, OK, so deflationary mint should fix this, right? Like HIP 20. Well, the deflationary mint, yes, it, de it, it does help things. It decreases the, the amount uh, given to contributors as time goes on at a rate of what is called here rho d, the, the deflation rate. But the reward dynamics, if you take the derivative of mu m, you get that it equals to rho minus rho d times mu m. So if you think about it, the sign there is important. If it's positive, 
it means you have an exponential rise, at least locally speaking. If it's negative, you've got this exponential fall. So again, too large and too little. So how do you get the Goldilocks? And if equations are not your thing, here's some graphs. Purple shows the situation where the, contrib the contributors don't receive enough, right? So there, the value seemingly stays pretty flat. It seemingly is, is an economy that's going to be, uh, let's say, providing the value that token holders are looking for. However, the rewards are going down exponentially. So at, at some point, given that contributors do work for positive amounts of money, it's going to reach a threshold where you just do not have enough contributors. And in all fairness to HIP20, by the way, there is a net emissions uh, in that to, that's supposed to fix that. It just, as far as I understand, not been implemented yet. The blue line shows the situation where you're, not provi you're providing, let's say, too much to the contributors. So you can see there an exponential rise. Eventually, your token holders will abandon you, and the value of your economy will collapse. And so this is just simulating those equations, those very same equations that I showed you. So again, what's the, what's the, what do you need to do? You need to set the deflation, or the deflation rate to be equal to the discount rate. And, and you're done, right? But that's not possible, right? How, how, how are we going to know the discount rate? Like, I can't get into every single person's mind in the world and, and determine that. We can guess at it. We can make like our own Federal Reserve of uh, Onakoi, I suppose, and uh, guess at that. But the point is, it's just a fairy tale, right, to be able to do something like that. The good news is, we do have a solution. And that is basically to extend that price oracle from, from the burn side also to the mint side. And in that way, what you get is a Goldilocks economy. So before I move on to the next slide, let me repeat that. Basically, what you should do is price the mint rewards in fiat to, to contributors. So don't say, look, I'm going to give you a certain amount of tokens on a deflationary schedule, and one year you get this, next year you get that, et cetera, et cetera, halving period, you know, very Bitcoin-y, I suppose. You're just going to get five bucks a day. That's what I'm going to give you. And uh, if you do the math, and so here Z is the, that five bucks that you're getting, and so the mint uh, should be Z divided by mu, which is the price, right? And if you do that, and you just take the derivative of M in that case, you get that M dot equals minus rho M, which is exactly what we wanted. And that's how we got Goldilocks. And it's just right. So if you do the, the simulation there, you'll see the rewards are flat, obviously. That's by design. And the value also stays pretty high. So everyone's happy, contributors and, and token holders. But to finish, let me go back to what's necessary here. And this is a point that wasn't really made in our work, but it's something that I'd like to mention here. And that is that there is no, there's no, there's no free lunch, right? Like, uh, we as designers and engineers, tokenomics engineers, let's say, uh, w all we can do is ensure that this economy works, right? We can make mistakes that cause it to collapse, but we can't just create money out of thin air. The, the value has to come from something, and that is revenue. So focus on the revenue as a project, and just make sure you don't make any mistakes with the tokenomics, and you'll be fine. That's it. Thank you so much.